You are listening to the APSI Podcast, the association of people supporting employment first, with your host, Chris Davies. Okay, welcome back, everyone, to the Minnesota APSI Podcast. Uh, we're so glad you're here, as always, uh, today broadcasting live from Studio A, as we like to call it. And very excited to have Alex Tabatabai here with us today. Say hello, Alex. Hello. Hello, everyone. And we're going to be diving in and learning uh, so much about Alex and, and all that he's up to. We've been talking here for a few minutes before we got to uh, to recording, and it's just a fascinating man. I think you're all going to enjoy the conversation. As I always want to do before we dive too far into it, uh, for anybody that might be new to Minnesota APSI, or perhaps you've never heard of Minnesota APSI, what we're all about, I'd like to go over our, our purpose statement with you. So Minnesota APSI is an action-oriented organization. We exist to bring people together to raise expectations so that people with disabilities can be employed and contribute and assume their roles and responsibilities as citizens in their communities. Now, employment is the same wages, standards, responsibilities, expectations, and opportunities available to any working age adult. We believe that one person at a time, employment is the avenue out of poverty and isolation. And I dare to say, Alex, you'd agree with that, would you? Oh, I absolutely agree with that. Yes. All right. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So... Before we start out the conversation, uh, we're talking with, with Alex. I want to, uh, do a quick visual description. Uh, again, I am, uh, my name is Chris Davies. I actually don't think I said that, did I, Alex? So, hello everybody. I'm Chris Davies, the host of the Minnesota Apsy Podcast. And I am a white male. I'm, I'm bald and I'm wearing a, a long sleeve, uh, white and blue checkered shirt today and blue jeans. Alex? Yeah. Uh, my name is Alex Tabarabai. Um, I have medium length brown hair. I am wearing a cochlear implant in my right ear and a cochlear implant with a hearing aid on my left ear. And today I'm wearing blue scrubs that has the University of Minnesota uh, logo embroidered on it. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. I like that you came. Uh uh, you're, you're committed to the bit, if you, as we like to say in the, uh, in the business. So, all right, and go Gophers. Oh, yes, absolutely. Go Gophers. Let's get it. Yeah, so let's get into it. So, Alex, uh, as you may imagine, uh, is a University of Minnesota dental student. He's in his second year. And, uh, he's already, you know, described a little bit about who he is. So, you know, I'd love to, to just dive into, to a little bit more about you, Alex. You know, if you can tell the audience, you know, a little bit about your background, growing up, you know, yeah. just throw it at us. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I was born in Rochester, Minnesota, an hour and a half away from the Twin Cities. And I was born in this family of six. I have three siblings, all sisters. So I'm the only boy. And when I was born, I was actually born completely deaf. Um, I had not completely deaf, but it was more like severe to profound hearing loss on my right ear and moderate to uh, severe hearing loss on my left ear. Okay. So to put that in a scale for the audience to understand like how severe that, you know, auto, you know, the deafness is pretty much I can only hear traffic noise. I would say drill noise, you know, airplanes fireworks, things like that. So when I was born into this world, my parents didn't find out I was deaf until I was two and a half years old. And so because of that, I lost a lot of my language skills. And it's interesting because like back in the day, they didn't do hearing tests in newborns. So I guess like babies could be born and then they don't even know if they're deaf or not. But now, you know, the law changed and they say, hey, you know what, you need to make sure you do hearing screens. So that's a good thing. But um, pretty much I was wearing hearing aids at the year of two and a half years old. I was just had, I didn't have cochlear implants, just hearing aids. So hearing aids are devices where, you know, you receive some sort of sound and it amplifies it. So I was wearing that for about 10 years. And then I decided to get a cochlear implant because when you're wearing hearing aids, they really don't help you all the time. You know, they can only help you so much. 
It's a treatment, not a cure, right? So then I decided to get a cochlear implant, you know, and it was one of the best uh, life-changing things I've, you know, decided. And the reason why we waited so long to get a cochlear implant is because we had, my parents were really optimistic on, like, you know, stem cell regeneration therapy. They thought, oh, you know, maybe you can regenerate the hair cells and the cochlear because, I mean, the type of hearing loss I have is called sensor neural hearing loss, which is damage to the human nerve and the cochlear cells, the hair cells. So, yeah, they were very optimistic. And, you know, you don't know when tech- new technology is going to come out. So we decided to get the cochlear implant. So I got my first cochlear implant on my right ear. And it was life-changing, I would say, because I was able to hear more things that I could ever imagine. You know, I started listening to music more. I could hear the birds chirping, which I never heard that before. I could hear the clock ticking before. So I was like, oh, this is really awesome, you know. And then it got me really interested in technology in general. So I was like, you know, always fascinated about computers, you know, um, just music. Yeah. And so that's why I decided to actually at first become a computer engineer, you know, which is pretty interesting. Um, went to, you know, college at a university called um, Rochester Institute of Technology over in Rochester, New York. And the reason why I went to that college actually was because they had this great community of, you know, deaf individuals who need some like accessibility services to help them progress through the, getting their degree. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the university at all, Rochester Institute of Technology, are you? I actually have not uh, heard much about it. Really? Yeah, so I find this interesting. Yeah, so like it's called RIT, and there's actually like two colleges or universities that really provide a lot of support to deaf and hard of hearing students. And that's one of them. And then the other college was Gallaudet. So deafness, you have to think of it as like a big spectrum, right? You have people on one side that can like hear I mean, they would choose to wear, like, cochlear implants or hearing aids, choose not to sign, they just speak, right? And then you have the other side of the spectrum, and that's where people choose not to wear cochlear implants or hearing aids. They choose not to speak. They sign only, and they're just very, you know, integrating this deaf culture, pretty much. So Gallaudet is a university where they pretty much have that really rich deaf experience, like deaf culture, deaf community, and RIT was offered to students more so i would say in all parts of the spectrum you know which they call capital d deaf and lowercase d deaf capital d means like you sign only and you don't speak and lowercase d deaf means you speak you don't really sign you don't know much about the deaf culture and deaf community so yeah um so yeah i went to rit because i thought that's what's the best fit for me because i really wasn't like involved in the deaf community back in the day and, you know, my parents, they thought I didn't need to learn any sign language or anything. So they said, yeah, you know what? He'll be normal, right? He's okay. And, you know, it, 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 thank God, you know, with all the support and everything, I made it through. So, yeah, when I went to RIT, computer engineering my stand, and then I said, you know what? I don't really want to sit down and just, you know, look at a screen all day, you know, so... I decided, you know, let's do some sort of, like, patient care experience or whatever. You know, I want to interact with people. I'm a very extroverted person. I can't help it, you know. So I said computer computer engineering is not my thing. So I know medicine was a backup because I was like, I love patient care experience. So I did biomedical science, not knowing exactly what I want to do. But I thought radiology would be interesting because, you know, it has some kind of computer, like engineering kind of thing incorporated with patient care. And I thought that's really cool. And then I said, you know what? Nah, I, I'm going to shadow more, you know, positions. And I shadowed a dentist. He's apparently he was deaf. And I was like, hmm, okay, let's check this out. You know, this is going to be an interesting experience. And Pretty much on the spectrum, I would put him in the middle. So, you know, capital D, lowercase e, right in the middle. He's integrated with both worlds, the deaf world and the human world, right? So I saw how the coworkers interact with him, how he interact with his patients. You know, it was just amazing, really, really amazing. And so the guy is named Chris. It's funny. <laughs> That's a great name. Did he spell with a C-H? Yes, he spelled with the wow. C-H. Yep. And so, Dr. Chris, he... <laughs> I shall now be called. 
Yeah, Dr. Chris, he was great because um, the way how he interacted with his patients, you know, he made sure he talked to them face to face. You know, sometimes dentists, they kind of like not talking to them straight face to face. They don't look in the eye. They're kind of like looking down on their clipboard or whatever and just like ask medical questions. But no, Dr. Chris, he looked at his patients face to face, asking them questions, making sure the, the patient really understands him. And, you know, when it comes to growing up being, you know, deaf and hard of hearing, you have to really communicate with people face to face because we rely on body language, facial expressions and lip reading. So it was just really fascinating to see how he interacted with patients, how his coworkers were really interacting, like how they know how to, you know, help him out. If he didn't understand anything, you know, it was interesting because like the coworker would remove the mask and they would lip read what the patient was trying to say to him. And then Dr. Chris would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is what it is, you know. And so that was really awesome. And I was, at, that point, I know, at, time, at that point in time, I was like, I could be a dentist, you know. We're not limited. I mean, even though we have a disability, we're not limited on doing certain things. We, as, yeah, yeah. So. yeah, so when you when you met Dr. Chris, it, where were you exactly? You were at R- RIT, right? So, yes, at I was at RIT yeah. in my senior year. Okay, in your senior year. And it was just sort of an opportunity to do an experiential kind of thing, or was it an actual internship? It was actually exper- uh, experimental because um, first three years of the computer, uh, computer engineering, and then, you know, I had to switch my major midway through, and then the last two years was biomedical science. And so I didn't have that much time to, like, experiment, so I try to shadow many positions as possible. But, yeah, Dr. Chris, he, yeah, he was great, and, you know, he made me get interested in the field of dentistry, especially when we had patients who come in, you know, they have some kind of, like, teeth abnormalities or their jaw is not positioned right. And because of that, they're very limited on how they can facially express or lip, I mean, say things. We can't really understand what they're saying when they move their lips because maybe it's not clear to us, per se. And so when we were able to fix their, you know, court, I mean, with their, whatever their um, condition is, it was really easy for me to understand them after. You know, they were able to facially express more. They had better body language. And I was able to lip read them a lot better. And, you know, that was very personal to me because I grew up, you know, going through all those things, through all those modes of communication. And if I can have the ability to fix that, I was like, this is amazing. I, I want to do that. And then not only, not only on top of that, like dentistry is a lot of it's techno- technological, right? You know, we are using 3D printers. We are using milling machines. We are using radiographs, which I'm very interested in. And then also we had the patient care component with that and my personal connection of, like, treating people with, you know, body. Did you say radiographs? Yeah. Uh, so, like, yeah. So, yeah, like. Describe, what, what is that exactly? A radiograph. So, pretty much when we take an x-ray on a patient, we want to observe um, any, you know, signs of, like, what's going on in the oral cavity. It's like a black and white like image. And we always take radiographs on patients who comes in who have tooth pain or toothaches to make sure that, you know, maybe it's a cavity or maybe it's an infection. And we use radiographs to help us determine that, to diagnose them, really. It's, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So, yeah, so you went uh, after Dr. Chris, uh, and, and when you left... Um R I T. I keep wanting to yep. say R T I. I don't know why, but R I T. Uh, then you went. Uh, you applied for dental, dental school. Dental school. Yes. Yeah. You know the application process was interesting. Um, you have to take this uh, admission test. You know when you go to medical school, you have to take the thing what's called the MCAT. It's like a medical admission test. But when you apply to dental school, you have to apply the DAT, which is the de- dental admission test. And, you know, the DAT and the MCAT, the medical and dental, they're very similar, like, test. Um, the dental admission exam is actually five hours long. And, you know, you sit there on a computer for five hours and you answer the best you can on biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, all these different questions that are thrown at you. And then you get a score and you're placed on a percentile saying, oh, you're ranked 75th percentile or 80th percentile or whatever. 
And so I did well. Um, I mean, at first, when I first took the DAT, I didn't, I did okay. And I was like, you know what, this is probably a good score for me to apply with all my experiences that I've, you know, went through. And so I applied and I actually didn't get in my first time I applied, what was it, 14 schools? And, you know, when it comes to applying schools, you, you have to be very selective. You know, you can't just apply to all public schools because, you know, public schools are very selective on, you know, accepting people who are in state rather than out of state, right? So, yeah, I wasn't really smart with my decision on, you know, applying on certain schools. That's why I think I couldn't get in. So then I applied the second time and also retook the DAT the second time, did better. And then finally I got interviewed by, I think, six, seven schools, which is good, and accepted by three. And I picked the University of Minnesota because, you know, that's where I was born and raised. And, yep, and I loved it. So oh, I'm glad they accepted you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it really seems like you are are truly on a path that you know. As I hear you talk about it, Alex, it feels like you are truly on a path of of your calling, you know, if, if you will. Um, what are your What are your uh, ambitions for? I know you're, like you said, a second year student right now, and, and we were talking before before recording that it's it's a four year program. Say. For yourself, in, in 10 years, where do you hope to be in the in the field of dentistry? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I want to serve my community, the deaf community. And I didn't really talk about how involved I was in the deaf community. And I want to go back to that really quick. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Because, you know, I only got involved or interacted with the deaf community when I went to RIT. I never did during my childhood, right? So I didn't know, know any ASL. Then when I went to RIT, you know, the experience was so rich. You know, I met so many people just like me and, you know, learned ASL in six months, but even or not. And, you know, some people takes years, but for me, I was like, it was easy for me because it's all visual, right? Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And so I was like, you know, with that kind of experience, you know, I just realized how underserved our community is and how sometimes, you know, we get discriminated, you know, when we try to apply jobs. And, you know, oh, you know, he can't hear, therefore he can't work. But that's not true, of course, because there were so many great people at RIT that's trying to get, you know, got great degrees. And they were working full time in all different sorts of professions, you know, computer engineering, software engineer, you know, mechanical engineer. I mean, it's a very technological school. Um, so there's a lot of engineering degrees offered there. So and they're just doing amazing. And so, yeah, what I was involved in that deaf community and I actually was representing them as a student government senator and we did a lot of projects together. Um, we try to make the campus more deaf and blind accessible because there were some areas on, I guess, in buildings that were not really accessible for those, you know, type of people. So we just couldn't, we just decided we want to, you know, make a committee and help those. And then we also like try to help deaf international students because they will come in from like different countries and their sign language is different from American sign language, right? Right. Just like any other language. Right. Yep. So, I mean, ASL is not a universal lang uh, language. A lot of people think that, but it's not. Right. So remember that. And so that they come in, they feel very isolated because they don't know how to interact with us. But, you know, we had a committee where we formed like a mentorship kind of program, sort of showed them around the campus, you know, have them become social with us, you know, learn our sign language at the same time, you know, try to learn their sign language too. So, and then there was another project where, you know, RIT, they offer, they have one of the biggest accessibility services I know in the world. They have so many captions, note takers, interpreters it is huge. And so my job as a senator was to make sure that my constituents have those accessibility services and everything was working fine. So the, that was majority of the things I was doing over there. And, you know, I loved it. And so I was really, I guess, I bonded with that community. And so when it comes to dentistry, I also want to do the same thing. I want to help and treat, you know, people who are in all sorts of like disabilities, not just hearing loss, you know, and that's what I want to do as a dentist. 
so we serve my uh, community. So, yeah. Yeah, that that's that's great. So you were a, a student government senator, mm-hmm. and it sounds like you had a, a, a huge impact on creating change, accessibility. Uh, so if I'm hearing you right, with your dentistry profession – you you are are hoping to open doors as well uh, of accessibility. Do you mm-hmm. see yourself having eventually? And I mean, I'm not trying to put big grand pressures on you or anything <laughs> like that. But do you see yourself having your own practice someday? Oh, or yes. What are your what are, what are your dreams? You know, it's funny because you know my dad he owns a business, and because I was I grew up in that type of type of environment. You know, I'm also a businessman too. I also want to have my own practice. You know, as much and so I do want to open many practices as uh, much as possible that is, you know, accessible, deaf accessible, blind accessible, you know, accessible to all different types of patients with uh, different disabilities. And that is one of my biggest, like, goals to do. So, yeah. And would you like to see your practice slash practices obviously accessible but open to just all people. Oh, oh yes. Uh, absolutely. I'm not all people you're not, not saying just... that, but I'm just saying like universal but universal. also making sure that cuz I mean I think about just the dentists I go to and I won't I won't say their name. They're they're <laughs> great, but I think about it and I don't now that I think about it, I'm not even sure the front entrance is is accessible. You know, you know, it's an old, old, uh, old, it's old building. building. It's yeah. like a practice made in a house, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing or out mm-hmm. of a house. Um, so you give me something to think about there. And I, I don't know why I, didn't, I usually think about that right away, but, uh, uh, yeah. So it's, I, I like where you're going with this. Yeah. I, I'm going to look you up someday. <laughs> Yo, please do come by anytime in like two years. So, okay. All right. <laughs> I love your ambition. Uh, what about just in, in general? Do you have any other, you know, hopes and dreams for accessibility, you know, across the board, even outside of, of dentistry? Yes. You know, like, I want to, like, not just, like, serve my community and, you know, all types of people I and mean, everyone. I want to also educate my, you know, constituents, like people, the dentist. You know, a lot of the dentist folks here don't know how to communicate with people with disabilities, and so I feel like I want to have like a seminar or, you know, be a lecturer on like expanding and advocating how to like really communicate with people with disabilities. And so that's also another grand goal I want to do. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. Well, you certainly uh, strike me as somebody that has uh, a lot of skills, uh, the ability to, you know, you, as you mentioned, uh, you're interested in technology, business, obviously dentistry. So mm-hmm. so that that specific uh, medical skill. And uh, I feel like you could command a room, you know, command an audience, you know, and, and teach people, you know, things. So. Yeah, I'll be very interested to see where you go with with all of this, oh, you know, in you. in the future. Yeah, it's 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 uh it's good stuff. Um, so Alex, do you have any closing, you know, words of wisdom or or thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with here today? Yeah, I actually do. Um, so to all the people who are in my shoes, you know, and as well have other disabilities. Um, you know, we all go through, you know, struggles and ob- obstacles, and it can be mentally challenging and mentally draining. And, you know, when, I come to, when it comes to those situations where I feel like I have enough for the day or enough with interacting with other people because they're not listening to me, um, I always say these three, like this quote, actually, that came from this ancient uh, Iranian prophet, and his name is Zoroaster. And he would say, focus on not only these three best uh, things in life, which is good thoughts, good words, good deeds. And, you know, I always repeat that in my head. You know, that's how it made me, you know, keep striving and grinding, you know, throughout the day to really be where I'm at today. So, yeah. That's fantastic. All right. Well, you heard it. Uh, You heard it here, folks. Uh, Alex, uh, I'm very excited to see where you go with your future, and uh, I know someday I'll be looking you up, and uh, I'd love to be a patient of yours someday. Yeah, swing by, you know? Oh, yeah, I'll swing on by. I might even stay for an hour or two. <laughs> <laughs> I always need a lot of dental work done. 
and that's not a joke. So, all right. Well, thanks again so much for being here. And just remember, everybody out there, I know Alex would agree, if you believe it, you can achieve it.